Welcome to The Winning Link, a show dedicated to dissecting business and leadership excellence. We take a deep dive into various aspects of business and operational excellence, current events, and personal and leadership development topics. The guests on the podcast will be credible industry leaders and practitioners, offering a portfolio of techniques and methods for positive growth. Welcome to The Winning Link. I have an exciting guest for you today, Mr. Norbert Majuris. Uh, Norbert is a renowned author of two books. Uh, he also goes all over the world to speak at conferences and workshops around innovation, right? I call him Mr. Innovation himself. Uh, he speaks at the Shingo Institute, uh, which is considered the Nobel Prize of Operational Excellence, the Association of Manufacturing Excellence. He goes globally uh, helping companies uh, tap into their innovative uh, talents to, and ideas. So, but without further ado, I'll let Mr. Norbert introduce himself and tell you a little about himself. Well, welcome, Norbert. Well, thank you, Billy, and uh, thanks for my new title. I will, uh, <laughs> uh, I will try to uh, keep using it. I will quote you for it. <laughs> I, uh, I actually uh, worked at Goodyear. That's why I met uh, Billy. I worked there for 39 years, and I spent my whole career in innovation. And um, I have uh, more. I have 60 patents, just counting U.S. patents. So I did do my share of innovation. But then I also got exposed to lead. Uh, later in my career. And um, uh, we, um, uh, together with my team at Goodyear, we came up with something uh, very unique. We found that uh, uh, you apply lean thinking to innovation, you may actually get more out of it than if you apply it to uh, uh, to, to manufacturing because you get multi you get a multiplier out of it, and uh, you can um, you can really uh, uh, also use it as the road to apply it uh, in in your whole uh, corporation. And the more uh, parts of your corporation uh, are part of that initiative, the higher the gains from it. So. Uh, Goodyear let me uh, publish uh, the results at that time, and um, in my first book, uh, Lean Driven Innovation. And then um, after I retired, I um, kept working with clients and and so on. There were also so many other stories that uh, I had that had made it in the first book. So uh, I had more than enough and uh, decided to write a business novel now which is all stories and um, try to let the user come up with what do these stories tell me and how can I use those in my work and in my company. So your new book, this is it, Winning Innovation. Mm -hmm. And it's a novel. Give me a little background about the book and the content. Yeah, well, um, I had to, uh, I I wanted to uh, get a few things across. Uh, First of all, um, the, uh, the, uh, the and, uh, innovation for me uh, should be uh, driven by uh, by R and D by the people who know the technology, and but it should be embraced uh, by the whole company, and um, uh, so it. Uh, the other uh, uh, big idea is uh, it, it's a it's a culture change, just mm-hmm. like uh, lean, and it's not a culture change that gets in conflict with any lean transformation that you do. It's a culture change that adds a lot of synergy, and um, the um, uh, and I also um, wanted to get the ideas ac- uh, across that um, if you do a lean transformation, uh, I was always of the opinion you just transfer the processes and everything else falls in place. But I was badly wrong. Um, the the cultural part is often more difficult than the process or the technical part. And um, I learned uh, that uh, if you do the two together, okay. you are, uh, uh, the results are better and much faster. Mm-hmm. So I think you lose, lose an opportunity if you just focus on processes and then try to bring the people along. Um, doing the two at the same time is really the, the, the way to do it. And all those ideas and many more um, come out in a story, and it's an um, uh, it's the com- uh, I 
placed it in, um, uh, in, uh, in Europe, in the northern part of Italy, a beautiful place, uh, mm -hmm. just as uh, well known for food and wine and for, than for bike, bike racing, of course. And, uh, and I picked an, a bicycle company because I'm a big uh, cyclist and I know that industry quite well. So that was a natural. And it was very colorful. And also, um, I wanted to bring the idea of the winning in there. Um, it's, um, uh, and uh, in, in, in this book, the, the company that I'm talking about is very good in winning. They win bicycle races. They have a racing team and they win bicycle races, but they don't win the business. And uh, they used to be really good in the business. They're very competent. They make the best bike in the world. But the revenue is coming down. And uh, they see the writing on the wall that they have to innovate in order to uh, to 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 win both on the road and in the business. That, that's that's kind of like most companies, though, in their journey to, to to innovate, right? To stay with the market. And one of the things that I noticed, you know, being a leader uh, in my Fortune 500 career, as well as working with other companies now, earning the right to change, and you said around the cultural piece, most companies in their innovative processes They do have the processes and the tools. So they go out and they say, here's what we're going to do. But what they don't do is the cultural right, the inclusive right, to get people to feel that this is what we need and we're a part of it because that's where we as humans, we don't reject change. We reject change being forced up on us. And, and just think about number when you and I are working Uh, in North America, right? You throw a new idea over the fence. Billy developed this new idea, and I threw it all. I threw it back over the fence. It was like a civil war of product development. And I would say to Norbert, "Hey, listen, listen. I have to hit the number round and black and out the back, man. That's all I, I want." And so with Norbert, we actually built our relationship over some of these examples, and we were out on some events, and we got to know each other. Uh, and become really close because a lot of times, actually, Norbert acts as my agent, I think, sometimes because people try to uh, connect with me through Norbert. But what that is, is that's a cultural shift, even beyond that. So how important is that Norbert, on people's journey to get everybody at the table? Yeah, that is kind of um, a very big challenge. It was a very big challenge, as good as you, as you uh, may remember. The, um, uh, we, we used to, and I, that's how I was educated at that time, uh, don't worry about um, uh, if anybody can sell the product or if anybody can make it. You just design it and then it becomes their problem. And that's a very expensive way to design uh, innovation. Because you design it many, many, many times. You design it every time somebody uh, figures out something that doesn't work. And um, uh, also, uh, uh, so if you if you really want to be successful at that, you get together um, before you even, uh, uh, while you still work on the idea, you get everybody engaged and get their input. And uh, you will have a, uh, a product that is much better and uh, you get them much faster because you don't have all these, uh, these rework loops. But I also uh, remember the times, Billy, when uh, whatever innovation we did uh, interfered with manufacturing. And uh, uh, you know very well, uh, all these new products, uh, uh, they take time away. They take uh, production capacity, time, yes. capacity away. And a lot of, uh, that's why at Goodyear, we built our own um, innovation center. And that's where we made all our prototypes. And uh, that we found out was not the way to do it. And actually, I, I still remember coming to Fayetteville the first time when I met you. I was on the team when we decided to let the plan build all the prototypes. That engaged the plan from yes. the very beginning. Of course, they said, oh yeah, then we get more head No, you get less headaches. Yes. You help us develop it, so we get your input. When we design it, we have all degrees of freedom. That's so right. if we notice something that has to be done differently, um, it can be done at that time. I um, heard from a, a major company, they uh, uh, still do a major effort to separate uh, everything. And at Goodyear, we made this effort to integrate everything. Absolutely. From, uh, it was a collective gate process. A yeah. collect you know what? Quality was at the table. 
right? Finance was at the table. Sales was at the table. And marketing. And here's why that was important. Yeah. I recall, right, we, we went from LVA, low-value-added product, to high-value-added product. So we were we were changing how we are going to uh, go to market, and and customer wanted our product. But we were releasing problem, the, the product, like you said, that was developed in sort of an incubator. And, and so that product, when it got to me, may have ran... 10 to 20, 30 percent waste. And the the quality person. <laughs> and when they were in the room and and I had to, to say who's gonna eat that 40%. Right now they had buy-in to go in and help me, and there was a, a collective team effort. And I believe that helped drive profitability for that company because I remember back when we were a negative EBITDA company and the journey to over a billion dollars EBITDA, it was driven by innovative products. Yeah. And, and uh, not only, you know, we, we did a lot of uh, good things at the same time, uh, Billy. We also implemented uh, a project management organization. Absolutely. We, uh, we developed that uh, collaboration and so on and so on. So I believe that all has to happen for innovation. Absolutely. It's not just having more great ideas. Uh, if you you need to really uh, get these ideas uh, through your system, and uh, they are not good ideas unless you make good money on them, and uh, that's something that I'm glad that we figured out, and that is a story that uh, that I developed uh, in this book really from an idea uh, all the way uh, through um, uh, a successful uh, a successful product in the market, and I think that's what it's all about to engage really everybody in that process process and uh, that synergy engaging everybody that's really uh, how you make a successful product and that's how you win absolutely uh, in the uh, with innovation well and that's continuous improvement when you look at companies innovation taps into that 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 whole talent base uh, some of the best ideas come from the lower ranked people in the organization right and so one of the things that I believe, successful companies do on our innovative journeys, our continuous improvement journeys, is do change with the people, not to the people. And so when you bring them in and they're, they're inclusive, that's when you really start to get traction. That's when you start to, to, to see the impact in the marketplace. Right. Well, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me give you an example of, uh, of a gentleman that I knew. Uh, he built experimental tires for me, and he built them like you said, round and black and out the back, 12 uh, of them an hour or 12 of them a shift. That's what's in my, uh, that's what in the union contract, and that was it. And uh, after the, uh, the, the plant uh, had gone through a transformation, he actually uh, won the DME uh, Excellence Award uh, uh, at the end, they, um, the people changed. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it struck me, I went through that plan 20 years after I worked with those people and I did a tour and there's the same gentleman, his name was Bill, by the way, and uh, he shows us how he builds a tire now. And I thought, oh, I hope that he doesn't show us how he built them when, uh, when he <laughs> built them for me. And it was totally changed. He explained to the group how he owns the machine. Yes. He's responsible for it. And uh, before he couldn't care less, now his goal was to make the best possible tire that he possibly could make. Yes. And, um, and, and he was so proud. He was actually put his name on the tire. Yes. And I said, but why did you do that? And he said, well, I want to see if this tire wins the next uh, NASCAR race next yeah. weekend. And, and it, it absolutely blew my mind. And I'm, I'm saying now, man, if I could have gone to Bill when, when we struggled to get an approval at, uh, at an OE uh, manufacturer, and uh, Bill had, uh, and I could ask him, hey, um, uh, how can I do this better? Do you have any idea how I can make this a little bit more tight or this and that? I'm sure he would have loved to help me. Absolutely. But it just wasn't in the books at that time. No, <laughs> but you know, and you, you mentioned Fayetteville. Uh, I have a book coming out called The Winning Link, and it talks about how to build an inclusive culture, how to get your ideas from your people. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually have had the experience to have to build relationships uh, with the steel workers. And, and I thought it was a great opportunity. But my greatest story is around a union vice president and we're walking. Became one of my greatest contributors and innovators. But day one, 
he didn't own anything, and he felt that we were doing it to them. It was all adversarial, right? And like you say, if he would have been invited to the table, his, his most powerful statement to me when I asked him, he says, of course, I'd love to help, but no one ever asked me. And, you know, one thing that we were on a tour, and I said to him, I says, approximately how many people work here? And he looked at me, and he goes, you want me to be honest? I said, yeah. He says, about half of them. I said, about half of them? I thought he was going to say 3,400 people. He says, they're not working because you're not including them. Absolutely. And uh, a story that I tell in my book on that subject is um, this, uh, uh, the owner of this uh, bicycle company, he, um, uh, he, he's in a conversation with uh, the, the leader of the transformation, and uh, she is uh, trying to convince him. Uh, I mean, they talk about innovation, how the, the company becomes more innovative. And he says, well, we... we uh, we, we can't win in innovation, he said, because we don't have any innovators. And then she says, well, how many people work here? Yes. <laughs> and he said, well, we have 300 people here on the site. She said, well, then you have 300 innovators. Yes, right. And then she says, well, you also have a, a manufacturing plant with another 300. So here you have 600 innovators. And he said, well, I never looked at it that way. Can you help me make this work? And she said, yes, that's why I'm here. Absolutely. That's what the inclusion means. And at the end, of course, as the story develops, uh, those people get engaged. They have ideas. And in fact, the manufacturing uh, vice president uh, uh, comes uh, in a meeting one day. He said, we always in manufacturing, we thought innovation was the privilege of R&D, he said. Mm -hmm. And now finally, my guys, uh, the people in my plant are so happy because now they can also contribute. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So now, what, what happens to companies that fail to innovate, that don't embrace the need to innovate? You know, we, we've heard of the, the uh, Kodaks. Yeah. We've heard of the blockbuster video companies that were thriving at one point, but, right, the the, 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 the the market need changed or the market desire changed and they didn't move with it. Well, I actually uh, was fortunate. I met, uh, I worked actually with the gentleman who was on the team that developed the first digital camera for Kodak. He okay. was working at Kodak in R&D and he showed me a picture of the prototype and, uh, and how the picture was actually displayed on an analog TV at that time. And Kodak had all that technology. So why did they not uh, jump on it? Uh, and they had it in 1975. That was 10 years before the next uh, uh, digital camera came out. By the way, that was uh, Sony, mm -hmm. by the way. And, uh, but the, the, the story is very simple. Kodak made so much money on film. They, their only concern was how can we kill this thing? Yes. Because this thing will kill our film. That was, uh, and many companies went that route, unfortunately. I could give you another three or four examples right on top of my head, um, exactly the same story. And uh, that is something that uh, a big obstacle in the culture that companies have to overcome. And uh, also, um, companies make these tiny little improvements and uh, continuous improvement. And uh, a lot of these improvements are in cost and... Um, yes. Uh, it is a lot, I, my experience, it's a lot easier to win if you bring out new products. Yes. Uh, it, you get a jump in price when you bring out a new product. People pay more money for innovation. Yes. And if you want to grow your market share, you can do it by making a, a better product, for example. Yes, you still have to do the best quality you can. Yes, you can do it by making a cheaper product. You have to do that. You have to manufacture your product as efficiently, as efficiently as you can. But when you're done with those two, you have to come up with something new. Yes. And then you make something new at that same quality level, at that same efficiency. And now you're starting to win in innovation. And many uh, successful business people went on record saying, it's probably the cheapest way to do it if you just uh, <laughs> promote the innovation and have a good system to, to drive the innovation, have good culture to drive yes. the innovation in your company. So. so when I look at that, is the book available now? 
Yeah, the book well, has been printed. It's out on Amazon. It's out uh, through the uh, through the publisher uh, Rutledge, uh, Taylor and Francis um, affiliate in this case. Uh, yeah, just um, just type my name or type the book title on Google, and you will find it. Okay. So w- w- what's going on with Norbert in the future? Any speaking engagements, workshops? Um, yeah, I um, uh, of course, um, uh, COVID put a big dent in uh, into my business. I try to do uh, try to do consulting. I'm still uh, doing um, a consulting, but I prefer the teaching. Uh, to be quite honest, I'd rather teach the people the principles, the principles um, uh, of the process, but also the principles of the transformation, uh, change management, uh, the behaviors, the uh, the principles that change your culture, yes. and then maybe coach them along the way. I'd rather do that than go into a company and say, now do this and now do that. That never worked for me. Um, I'd rather engage them. Uh, they come up with the ideas, and uh, I may uh, then look at them and say, yeah, this sounds good, and uh, maybe we could rethink a little bit here and there. And then it's their idea. They go do it. They have the background now. They know what they are doing. They have been taught. And um, maybe with a little bit of coaching sometimes, those transformations are much more successful in my mind. Uh, that's something I'd like to do. That's something I promote in my books. So I, I, should, I should be doing that. So I, I like to teach um, uh, do, do keynotes and so on. Yeah, that's always a good way. But if I, if I don't teach anything in that keynote, I have uh, not done my job. That's uh, that's my... Uh, and I don't think I changed my mind so quickly on that. So, so how do people get in contact with you, Nave? Well, uh, as I said, my name is very unique. If you know my name and if you type my name on Google, you will find me. Okay. Um, and um, uh, I... Uh, uh, maybe in your podcast, you're very welcome to publish my phone number. My uh, Yeah, email LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. You find me on LinkedIn without a problem. And uh, my, uh, my, my, my first name dot my last name at gmail.com to make it easy. Okay. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, I will answer everybody who contacts me. And if uh, I help a lot of people, by the way, and I don't, um, I don't, uh, need to charge money for it. If somebody uh, wants to ask me questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And um... You heard that. Norbert offers some pro bono advice as well. And Norbert and I would actually be doing a workshop at the AME conference in October. And so uh, stay tuned for that and, 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 and stay tuned to, to, to the LinkedIn, uh, uh, to LinkedIn to see what's going on in Norbert. And Norbert, you are a winning link. And so uh, I look forward to more podcasts, and I want to thank everybody for joining the Winning Link. And as my favorite saying goes, remember, if you make people visible, they will make you valuable. But that being said, Norbert, thank you for being on the Winning Link, and stay tuned. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Winning Link. Please go to our website, for links to everything that was mentioned in today's episode. Please subscribe to The Winning Link to be notified of our latest news, events, and updates. We welcome you to The Link Team.